Just before dawn breaks, in a quiet ditch at Wild Ken Hill, a water vole stirs, has a wash and tucks into its breakfast. And then the sun rose and shone and turned everything into glorious technicolour. A late start to spring, but a great start to week two of Spring Watch. Hello, Hello and welcome to Spring Watch 2021. It's our second week here, live from Wild Ken Hill in Norfolk. Now, if you were watching last week, you know that we started well, I think it's fair to say, with a bonanza of the very best of British wildlife. And this series is based around a mission. We want to talk about a vision for the future, and that's why we've come here to Wild Ken Hill. It is a farm, but they're farming very much with wildlife in mind, regenerative farming. They're also doing some rewilding and some classical conservation as well. And the dividends are that it's absolutely packed full of wildlife and there are plenty of nesting birds. And of course, we've got our cameras on plenty of those. So let's see what we've got at the moment. Look at that lapwing there on the right hand side. What a splendid animal with that little crest coming up. Absolutely superb. Pied wagtail still incubating. But there in the lower right hand corner is a nest that we introduced you to very briefly at the end of our programme on Friday. It's a sedge warbler. Now these are sub Saharan migrants. They come all the way from Africa to breed here, about a quarter of a million of them. The chicks are growing really well. They're only about a week old, but they've got to grow quickly because another week they could be fledging. Parents doing a brilliant job at feeding them. You can see there was a damselfly there, various insects. Look at this. A great catch there. Expert at catching those insects and straight into the beaks. But look at this. When the front one opens that beak, can you see in there there's a couple of spots? And all the chicks have got those. But what are those about? Well, not all chicks have them, but quite a few species do, and they can be very different. And if we look at this diagram, we can see this is a sedge warbler, and this is the open mouth, that's its gape, and inside the tongue, and those are the two spots that you could see on our chick's tongue. And then we look at a bird like the bearded reedling. This is the chick, that's the gape. You can see it's got white spots on its tongue, and then it's got these palette barbs, which are like sort of white warts. And what they think, scientists think, is that that stimulates, that open gape in those spots stimulate the adult to feed the chick and also gives the adult a target. I mean, particularly when you look at that, you can see that's a real target to put the food in. And they've done studies on other chicks that have all sorts of colorations in that gape. And they think that it can also gauge their growth and see how well they're doing. Because as the chick grows, the mouth will get bigger, the gape will get bigger, the spots will get wider. And so the adult can see just how their chicks are doing before they fledge. And do you know how they determined the fact that they are a targeting mechanism for the adults to stick the food directly into that gape? They got tiny paintbrushes with some of these other species of birds which have these gape tubercles and using a harmless substance they painted over the spots and found that those chicks didn't get as much food as those with the spots visible. And the bearded reedling that you had there, the bearded tit, we got some fantastic pictures of this a few years ago at Minsmere. They really do have the most striking mouths here. And I've come up with a theory, Michaela. You see, both the sedge warbler, look at that, look at that. That is stunning, isn't it? Spectacular, isn't it? Both the sedge warbler and the bearded tit both like to make their nests above water. And therefore, to keep their chicks safe, they make them with very deep cups. And it can be quite dark down in the bottom of those deep cups, particularly when the young are quite small. And what we see with other species in other parts of the world is that the birds that tend to have these nest in holes in trees. So I think it's to do with the darkness at the bottom of those cups that they've got those things. I like your theory. It makes sense. I'll, I'll take well, that I'll theory. obviously have to spend a lifetime <laughs> testing it, but maybe not this evening. I'll tell you what, let's go back to Friday again, because if you were watching on Friday or night, you'll know that just before the end of the programme, we got very excited by these columns rising into the sky. Thousands, hundreds of thousands 
of midges. We called them midge nados, and we'd never seen them before, so we asked if you'd spotted them too. We got this picture from the River Stour, and this came from Daniel Brown, and he spotted his very own midge nado there. And I was so enamoured by the midge nados that I immediately ran to one of the vehicles which was conveniently parked beneath one. And I clambered on top of it, got out my phone and started recording what I could see. And at one point, the midge nado descended and I was entirely enveloped by these insects. So they're midges, but they're non-biting midges. They're chironomid midges, about 600 species in the UK. And these are males. And the males form these massive swarms like this. And they hang over the vegetation. And the females rise up into the swarm, somehow choose a mate. We don't know how they do that. And then they copulate on the wing. Just think of that. Don't try it at home. <laughs> you might get injured or arrested. Fantastic stuff. It was an amazing thing to see, and we were all completely enamoured with it. I mean, there must have been thousands and thousands of midges. You couldn't really see them very clearly here, but we do have a close-up, courtesy of a friend of mine, Paul Brock, who's given us this one. Look, there you are. You can see the midges there. Fantastic antennae. Really attractive little insects. And I've got to say, when I was enveloped by the midges, you know, the force of their wings was drawing me up into the sky. It was an uplifting experience. <laughs> I'm just very, very glad they weren't biting ones, because there were an awful lot of them, and we would have been really surprised really bitten. But it wasn't just us that were seeing them. I mean, Gillian's in Northern Ireland and apparently she saw an amazing midge nado, didn't you, Gillian? <laughs> yes, we did. We did see midge nados here. I tell you what, they are bigger and better, I reckon, here in Northern Ireland. And if you don't believe me, later on in the week, we're going to be going to see the famous Loch Ness flies. And we'll be seeing more midge nados then. But for tonight, it's all about what's been going on here at Castle Lesby. And over the weekend, there was a very rare sighting indeed. Now, this is a gargane. This is a male gargane. It is one of the UK's rare ducks and it's thought that it was the very first record of this bird here at the reserve it caused a lot of excitement there's only a handful of these breeding birds here on the island of Ireland and so lots and lots of excitement so from rare ducks midge nados non-biting midges how about some biting midges up in Scotland and let's find out how yellow is going on up there Well, Gillian, I'm very, very pleased to tell you there are no biting midges up here yet. The Scottish midge will arrive, I'm sure, but thankfully the cold weather so far has kept it at bay. And yes, indeed, I'm up here in the north of Scotland in the wonderful Allerdale Wilderness Reserve, where they are literally changing the landscape for the better. They planted almost a million native trees so far. And in order to monitor the changes in the wildlife, Hannah Kirkland and her team have been putting out camera traps. They were out for the whole of last week. Hannah checked them over the weekend and she found this. One of the cameras had caught a family of badgers, a female or a sow, and three youngsters. Now, it's unusual for us, maybe, to see a badger set out in the open like that. Usually, they're in woodland or in a hedge bank, but in the uplands, you will find them out in the open. And it's a lovely sighting because, actually, badgers are not that common up here. So, cracking another mammal to add to the Allerdale list. And we will be looking at more of Allerdale's wildlife later on. But for now, let's go back down to Wild Ken Hill, Chris Michaela, and some of the drama that unfolded over the weekend. We have had some drama, but before I say that, we're so delighted to see those badges, aren't we? Look, I've celebrated, I've put my badger t-shirt on. Nice to see them in the open. Absolutely, particularly the young as well. But uh, as Yolo was saying, we have had a bit of drama down here at the weekend. Let's take a look again at our selection of live nests. First of all, I know those of you that have been watching them and enjoying them over the weekend online, you would have noticed we've got a couple of new nests, including a lapwing that's sitting there looking absolutely... Oh, it's facing the wrong way. No, but the know? crest is good. Look at yeah, the crest. But I looked at it a minute ago and it was beautiful. It was facing the right way. But you may have noticed that there is one nest that is no longer there. 
Yes, I'm afraid if you were watching last week, you'll know that we had all our cameras aimed at a little chiff-chaff nest. Well, the chiff-chaffs have gone, so what happened to our chiff-chaff nest? Well, the first thing to say about the nest is that they're very well hidden. Uh, they're normally made, I don't know, between 10 and 30 centimetres of the ground. They like to site them in brambles and long grass, particularly if there are leaves there. They make them out of that long grass and, you know, they take a bit of finding. Well. That's if you're looking visually. But, of course, there are potential predators that don't use their eyes. They use their noses to find them. And early on Sunday morning, one of the adult birds that was brooding the young inside the nest, we think there were about four chicks in there, um, was disturbed by something and popped out. Now, a study published in 1997 by uh, the BTO said that the most frequent predators of these birds were jays, magpies, snakes, cats, squirrels, dogs and... yes brown rats and here look you can see it doesn't go in through the front door it just muscles in through the side and this brown rat returned repeatedly with about six minute intervals taking each of the youngsters out either eating them itself or carrying them away of course to its own young now brown rats aren't native species they were brought in in the 1700s but they do now play a functional part in our ecosystem here so Whilst it's sad that the chiff chaffs are being eaten, you've got to think that the kestrels will be after this animal's young, the foxes will be after the brown rats. They have sort of integrated themselves into our landscape. But look at that, caught on CCTV. You're on Crime Watch, mate, and you're guilty. The uh, adult bird came back carrying a caterpillar, first meal of the day, and was no doubt disappointed to find that the chicks had gone. Doesn't waste the food, eats it itself, of course and then it collects just a little souvenir of its first breeding attempt this year. But that wasn't the only predator that visited the nest, because today we were watching that chiff-chaff's nest. Remember, all of the young have gone, of course, and this appeared. A grass snake is sniffing around. Now, whether it's sniffing for the chicks or for the rat, I can't tell you, but I do know that they are predators of birds like chiff-chaffs. Way back in the 1980s, I heard a pair of willow warblers making a terrible kerfuffle. And I looked down on the ground, I found their nest, couldn't figure out what was going on. They were jumping up to the entrance and then backing off. When I peered inside, there was a grass snake inside the nest, coiled up very neatly. And when I disturbed it and it slithered away across the gravel path, I could see all the little lumps in its body Oof. where it had eaten all of the baby willow warblers. Do you know what I find astonishing? I mean, we've only seen two predators on our live cameras and both of them have gone to the same nest. I know, but it shows you the pressure that mm. those nests are under when they're close to the ground. I'm pleased to say we've had more success, less drama on our marsh camera. We've got a live camera on what we're calling Avocet Island uh, for the obvious reason that it's got Avocets on and a lot of them are on nests. There's a lot of nesting going on if we zoom in we can see the avocets there and we've been watching these avocets over the weekends and as i say they've had a successful weekend there we go we've got the audrey hepburn looking rather elegant sitting on her nest and up she pops and you can see one of the chicks is beginning to hatch she settles down again to brood them there are four eggs underneath her but she's a little bit fidgety and there's good reason because as she stands up two of those wobbly little chicks are already out of their eggs and it wasn't long before all four of the chicks had hatched there they all go tumbling out they head down to the water straight away and they start to forage now they won't fledge for another four to five weeks they'll stay around the island stay with their parents get brooded at night very vulnerable at this stage and there's plenty of predators around marsh harrier in the sky there's a buzzard there on the ground and all of the adults will attack any predator and try and get rid of it in fact the instinct is so strong to protect their chicks in their nest they'll have a go at anything even these shell ducks clearly not going to predate the chicks or the eggs they're just trying to mind their own business and forage but the avocet is having none of it and trying to get rid of them there are the chicks. As I say, most of these nests have four eggs in them. And so we were rather surprised to see when one of them got up. And you'll see that adult in just a moment. Here it is. As it gets up, there's one, two, three, four, five little chicks 
underneath it. Now, as I say, we know that they only had four chicks each, so what's going on there? Well, I think the maternal instinct is so strong that when there is a predator and all the chicks just run for cover, they may be run to any adult, and the adult will protect any chicks that happen to be underneath them at the time. Or they might be crashing them as well. Some species will crash other, you know, uh, relative birds, uh, young, under them as well. OK, enough from here at Wild Ken Hill. Let's head north, very north, to the certifiably midge-free Allerdale Wilderness Reserve up in Scotland with Yolo Williams. Well, I've got to say, I do like an avocet. Beautiful black and white bird. Took me a long time to see my first avocet. It was early 1980s. I had to leave Wales and go all the way over to Norfolk, and it took even longer for avocets to eventually breed in Wales. And from one black and white bird to another, and when I came up here to Allerdale a couple of weeks ago for the first time, one bird that I was desperate to see was a black grouse. Now, this is a declining species. They reckon UK-wide there's probably somewhere in the region of about 5,000 displaying males. And to see the lek, you've got to go out before first light. This far north, that means setting off at 2 a.m. It's 2.30 in the morning and I'm on a wooden platform over the highest part of the estates. I'm hoping to see black grouse displaying and the lake itself, the display ground itself, is less than 50 metres away from me. So all I can do now is sit patiently and wait. You know what, an early morning start, but well worth it. The early bird catches the worm, and that was true that morning. And there was one point that morning when I was there, I was listening, I was watching the birds, that lovely bubbling song, a cuckoo called, and there was no other noise. It was just absolutely magical. And what was fascinating is that you had four birds one side of the fence, three birds on the other side, so seven birds in all, and that fence has been there before the lek, so they chose to lek there. And actually, it's worked for some of the birds because some of the males will jump up on top of the posts and display up on there as well. So males, all males, where were the females? Well, at this time of year, the females will be incubating. They only come on to the lake usually sort of April time. And those males we saw there, they were posturing, really. There was no real fighting. The fighting takes place earlier on in spring. This footage was sent to us from a lake in Aberdeenshire. And this lek, well, just watch what happens here. They gather on a typical lek, quite a bare area where they're 
voices will carry a long way. The young males on the edge of the lek, and in the middle, the two dominant males, equally matched, really going at it, using everything, using their claws, their beaks, their wings to get any advantage that they possibly can. And it is rough, you see feathers flying everywhere. This reminds me, I worked for the RSPB and we did a lot of work on these birds in 1988. I was watching a lek with eight males and right in the middle was this bald-headed, one-eyed blackcock displaying like mad, just fighting everything. And at the end of that spring, the poor male was taken by a female goshawk. All of that fighting and it was taken, just wiped out completely. But it had achieved what it wanted to. It had passed on its genes to the next generation. So its chicks are probably still in North Wales or their offspring anyway. Fantastic birds. And if ever you get the opportunity to go out on a guided walk, some of these uh, estates, the RSPB does it, to show you a black cock lek, then please do go, because it is absolutely fantastic. Well, I'm pleased to say that spring has finally sprung up here at Aladale. The last week has been lovely and warm and the landscape is transformed. But under the waves, in the southwest of England, spring arrives much earlier. Spring arrives in the southwest. The sunshine finally begins to warm up our coast. Beneath the waves, things are about to kick off. As our coast's most tropical and vivacious seasonal fiesta begins. With water temperatures tiptoeing above 10 degrees Celsius, the first party guests arrive sharply dressed and ready to impress. Shape-shifting common cuttlefish arrive from the deep to fill the dance floor and eager to find a mate. Pinstriped and pushy, this male guards his newly acquainted partner closely. But that won't deter this pumped-up interloper from muscling in, sneaking up from behind his dramatic dress is a show of aggression. Dark rings around his eyes show that things are getting serious. But the smaller male won't back down. He waves his cape like a matador and stretches out his fourth arm. It's like red rag to a bull and the bigger interloper is victorious. The female is stolen right from under the other male's mantle. As the water temperature rises and reaches 15 degrees Celsius, plankton blooms, producing a feast for one of the party's more introverted guests. they have a more faithful approach to romance. Short, snouted seahorses. A pair nestled in the seaweed. They also arrive here to breed, but unlike the scandalous cuttlefish, this pair only have eyes for each other. They dance, sensually swirling around each other. A twisted tango, reaffirming their bond. In seahorses, it's the male that carries the young. And he has swollen his brood pouch with seawater, a declaration of readiness. But for now, the females playing hard to get. Capable of raising five broods a year, he still has plenty of chances. And the party is just getting started.
As temperatures soar, party guests continue to pile in. Soon, these coastal waters will be the warmest in the UK, recently reaching a record high of 20.4 degrees Celsius. And this simmering heat is attracting newcomers. The stinging tentacles of a snake locks an enemy keeps the crowds away from the hottest new arrivals. Snake locks shrimp. This particular species only lives protected in the arms of anemones, where they can dine on detritus in peace. These shrimps first appeared off the British mainland in 2007. But since then, they become more than just tourists. They're now regulars on the south coast. The marine life around Britain is dazzling and diverse, especially during the party season. A finny fiesta triggered by the warmth and light of spring. Well, it is sounding a lot like Club Tropicana out there, and it has been feeling like Club Tropicana over here in the sunshine. And I tell you what, we have fallen in love over here in Northern Ireland. We've fallen in love with one black-headed girl called Betty. Now, she is just one of hundreds, and let's remind ourselves of what happened. On Friday, we revealed two chicks. She started that nest off with three eggs. One was lost in a storm, but two of them hatched. We can see them here. Now, Betty is a very attentive mum. We saw her feeding these chicks, but we had a surprise in store because in the background, in that shot, you can just about make out an extra egg and a mystery chick. Now, Betty is now brooding three chicks, one egg, and only two of them were there originally and of hers. So what on earth is going on? Well, some of you might be familiar with the idea of brood parasitism. So species like cuckoos that lay their eggs in the nests of other species and let them do the hard work. But this can also happen in the same species. And when it's done like that, it's called intraspecific brood parasitism. So this is what happens with black-headed gulls, and this is the likely explanation of how that mystery egg ended up in Betty's nest. So that clears up what happened with the egg. What about that extra chick? Well, you might remember last week, we watched a chick from a neighboring nest rolling out of its nest. Now, sadly, that chick rolled into the water and it didn't survive. But let's take a look at what happened on Betty's nest. Now, here we can see there's Betty with her chicks. And as that one leans back, it falls, tumbles out into the water. Now, to be honest, it doesn't look that bothered about being in the water, but Betty is clearly quite stressed and she's called to it and it looks for an access, a way to get back onto that nest. And we really were quite worried, but it did find its way back to safety. And again, we've witnessed right around the reserve that adult black-headed gulls don't always welcome these stray chicks. So it's really lucky for that one that Betty took it under its wing. So we have brood parasitism, we have adoption. It sounds like family life on a black-headed gull colony is very fluid indeed. But those extra mouths to feed have taken their toll on Betty's nest. Now, we caught up with it again, and this time we immediately saw there'd been a casualty. One of the chicks had perished, had died. A quick scan, and we were relieved to find that the other chicks were still doing well. So there's still three chicks. Now, we know Betty is an attentive mother. We've watched her provisioning that nest and we will continue watching that nest because we're quite sure there are going to be plenty more twists and turns as we continue.
And you know what's really amazing is that we've only been focusing on this one nest. There are hundreds of other black-headed gull nests here on the reserve, and each one will be facing all kinds of drama and challenges. And that's not just here on the reserve. Our wildlife in the UK has faced many challenges, especially this spring with a very weird spring that we've had. And to shed some light on that meteorological mystery is our very own Nick Miller. Yes, let's face it, this spring's weather has got us all talking, particularly when it comes to that huge swing from our sunniest, frostiest, and one of our driest Aprils on record, to that washout May. One of our wettest, the wettest in Wales, and a spring overall which has been one degree colder than the long-term average. Our wildlife is dealing with more extreme weather, but could there be something else going on? I'm talking about longer spells of the same type of weather. Let me bring you a tale of two Mays, starting with the jet stream, that ribbon of fast-moving air high in the atmosphere which brings us the British weather we know and love, changeable. Occasionally it dips and we find low pressure coming our way with wind and rain, or it rises above us, we get high pressure, it's dry, it's settled. Cast your mind back to May last year, and the jet stream became stuck in this position. We had persistent high pressure. If you remember, it was the sunniest of any month on record in the UK, and one of our driest Mays, the driest in England. And that made life very difficult for one of our most familiar garden birds, the blackbird, with the rock-hard ground, making it tough for them to get to the worms they need to feed their young at that crucial time. Now compare that with May this year, the jet stream stuck again, but in a very different position, dipping to the south of us, we have low pressure, persistent low pressure, that washout May, and up to the end of it, it was cold. And that made life difficult for migratory birds returning, such as the swift, with persistent northerly winds acting like a roadblock to their arrival, and once here, the cold, wet conditions making it difficult for them to find the food they need. Now, a friend of the watches, Mark Glanville, runs Bristol Swifts, and he says they expect the majority of their broods this year to be much later than usual, the time squeeze putting added pressure on their breeding success. What we've seen in the past two Mays may just be part of the natural variability of things, but there are people looking into whether climate change, and particularly the rapid warming of the Arctic, may be affecting our jet stream pattern, and perhaps making it more likely to become stuck, giving us longer spells of the same type of weather, and the extra challenges that brings to our wildlife. Thank you very much, Nick. And it's clear, therefore, that weather can have an impact on the behaviour and breeding success of our birds. So last year, the blackbirds were having a tough time. This year, the swifts are having a tough time too. And as Nick said at the beginning of that item, it's been a very unusual year weather-wise. Let's take a look at those nests that we've got live cameras on at the moment here. So we've got a great range of species. We've got kestrels there, we've got buzzards, we've got the swallows, we've got the pied wagtails. But there is something missing. And Sarah Jane wrote to us on Twitter and said, I'm enjoying watching all of the different birds, but I'm missing the blue tits. She's absolutely right. We don't have a blue tit nest this year. First time ever since I've been doing the watches and since I you've think been for me doing as well, it yeah. as well. But people haven't just let us know that they're disappointed we haven't got a blue tit nest. They're also upset that they haven't got a blue tit nest in their garden or that it's failed. We had this on Twitter from Anne Ely. There seems to be a large death rate amongst blue tit chicks this year all around the country. All six of my chicks have perished. John Buckman wrote me a letter that I received today. No blue tits in the nest box this year, the first time in eight years. Well, first of all, let me tell you that we did actually have um, a nest in a nest box before we started the series. We put a live camera on it. They, they laid the eggs, the eggs hatched, it had six chicks, and then one by one, they just didn't make it. They weren't getting enough food until the last one perished and that nest I'm afraid to say it was unsuccessful before we even came on air. And there are lots of comments like Anne Ely's on social media, but that's subjective comment and we all like that and we like to share it, but what we also need is some quantitative science. So we spoke to Dr Charlotte Reagan, who works at Whiteham Wood in Oxford, and there they've been collecting data about tit species since 1947. And she's given us some of the preliminary data from this year. So here is the proportion 
proportion of clutches that failed from the earliest broods of Blake great tits that were, were, were hatched last year, 2020. And look here, we've got tremendous amount of success. Only 4% of them failed. This year, a very different picture. So here, 24% of the clutches from those earliest broods have failed. And it gets worse, I'm afraid, when we look at the young birds in the nest. Similar sort of data from 2020 here, 4% of a proportion of those chicks from the earliest broods died before reaching two weeks old. This year, 37%. So that's the sort of mortality that we're looking at, and Anne Ely has reported, and that we've seen here at Wild Can Hill. It's that 37% of young birds dying in the nest before they're two weeks old. And this isn't just down to weather. This is also down to a, a phenological mismatch. And simply put, that's all about timings. Now, the success of blue tip relies on lots of different things. It relies on oak trees, winter moths, and hatching of blue tits. So the hatching of the winter moth caterpillars is timed with the bud burst of the oak trees. So basically, the buds need to be out in time for the caterpillars so that they have something to eat when they hatch. The blue tip chicks hatch to coincide with an abundance of those caterpillars. So adult ticks, tits have food to feed their chicks. But this year, this rather strange spring has changed the timing of all of that. Yeah, what happens if the timing of that system gets messed up? I've got a fantastic prop over here. You're going to love this one. Look, the months of the year, January, Feb, March, April, May here. This is the oak tree. Here's the caterpillar that feeds on it. Here's the blue tit that eats the caterpillar. Now, normally, oak leaves start to get their buds around here and then they start to open towards the end of April and into May. The caterpillars then need to be feeding on those, so they appear just a little bit later. And the blue tits time their breeding here so that when the chicks hatch, there's an abundance of these caterpillars. That's when it's all in order. But what about if there's a mitch match that's been you know, enacted by the weather, as there was this year? So it was really, really cold this year, and the leaves on the oak trees didn't open until much later, which meant that the caterpillars were much later, but the blue tits, unfortunately, didn't switch to breeding later. It's not within their capacity to do that. They were breeding at the normal time, which means that by the time the chicks had hatched and they were hoping for this glut of caterpillars on the oak leaves, unfortunately, they simply weren't there yet. And what made it worse was that when the rains came, they washed all of the caterpillars off of the trees onto the ground and blue tits like to forage up there in the canopy. So whilst the robins and blackbirds had a bonanza of food on the ground, the poor old blue tits were going hungry. It certainly seems, doesn't it? I mean, from the data that we've got already and people's comments that this is going to be a really bad year for blue tits. But they do have the capacity to recover. Yeah, and there are some good news. There is a little bit of good news, I'm pleased to tell you. I mean, just take a look at this photo. This is from Melissa Collum from Harefield in London. There are 18 blue tit chicks in her nest box, which is a phenomenal number. There are usually only about eight to ten. I reckon that's probably two broods in bit there. Of egg don't you? I think it's a bit of As egg dumping. As we've seen with the other birds here, the partridge, etc. But, the, but, you know, there are success stories. I was chatting to Zoe Ball on Radio 2 this morning. Oh, you name-dropper. I was. And she's, she's got, she's got um, a nest in her garden. And so, you know, there are nests around. We just keep our fingers crossed that at least some of those are going to be successful. And, Melissa, do let us know how your 18 blue tits get on. We'd, we'd love to hear. That would be fantastic. Now, it's been a really challenging year, of course, the last year for many people. We've all had to adapt in various ways. In various, oh, in, we have to adapt to speak properly in various ways. Now, a young filmmaker and photographer, self-trained, Rachel Bigsby, actually lost her job twice, not once, but twice. She didn't let this get her down. She thought, do you know what? I'm going to use the stresses and strains of this pandemic to actually do something purposeful. So she went down to her favourite patch of coast and turned her lenses on one of her favourite birds, a magnificent ocean traveller. It's the magic and the mystery of the sea that mesmerises me. As a child, it was always the horizon that I wanted to run to.
My granddad was an avid fisherman and naturalist. My passion for the coast and all things coastal wildlife definitely stems from him. And I owe him so much thanks for that. The day I realised I had true seabirds nesting on my cliffs was probably one of the best days of my life. The Northern Fulmar is the bird that ignited my passion for wildlife photography. They live in a world of so much mystery. This is a bird that has seen life over the horizon and braved unimaginable storms. While other seabirds might seek refuge, the formers are out there battling the elements. I really love a stormy coast and I think that's another reason why I love the formers because they dance in the wind, they're so free and effortless. So northern formers are really distinctive in flight. They have very, very stiff wings and fast wing beats followed by an effortless glide. They stand out as true warriors to me, but hardiness is not the only strong character trait of the Northern Fulma. They're also incredibly loyal. They return to the same nest site every single year to rejoin their long-term breeding partners that they wouldn't have seen over the winter months, but are reuniting with. As I walk towards the cliffs in early spring and hear those strong, prominent cackles, I really know the season has begun. There's a lot of cackling, there's a lot of head bobbing and billing where the former pair will click their bills together. It's a really lovely sound. The males make themselves look much bigger as well. They've got thicker throats. And suddenly the cliffs come to life. All these formers are moving and cackling and dancing in the ledges and it's really lovely. When I watch these relationships between the formers, I notice that passion and love and respect they have for one another. These are relationships and friendships that have stood the test of time. The relationships between the neighbours here surprised me at first. What I thought was perhaps anger displayed to one another because their cackle is so harsh, it actually turns out to be affection. They'll fly up to a ledge where another former is present and they have this sort of communication of one in the air and one on the ledge and this one's flapping talking and this one's swaying talking. I've always admired this bird, but having more time to see a window into their relationships and lives has only heightened my respect for them. With an unbreakable bond, these former pair will stay on the cliffs to raise their chick for the summer before all departing to live their lives beyond the horizon. After a long winter at sea, these formers will return back to the cliffs in Sussex next year to do it all again. And so will I.
Top work, Rachel. Top work. I really like that. Fighting spirit. Mm. Doesn't let her get her down. Went to the coast and turned out a film like that, which is absolutely brilliant. I love Four Mars too, actually. They're stiff wings flying along like that. Absolutely uh, amazing birds. They're members of the Procelliformi, so they're closely related to albatross, shearwater, petrels and storm petrels. And all of those birds have a strange nose. They have nericorns. And I've got a uh, full mass skull here and if you look on top here this bit here is its nostrils and they're very long and exaggerated they do have salt glands at the top here which they excrete the salt from and it runs down this part of the beak here and drips off the end but also they are equipped with a, a fantastic sense of smell which they use to find their food and they will scavenge for carrion or they'll take squid and salps and jellyfish and things like that they used to be quite a rare species only found on one UK island St Kilda right off the west coast of Scotland but then when we started processing fish at sea and dumping all of the offal over the side, these birds could sniff it out using their nericorns here and then they uh, started to spread and all the way down to the south coast where Rachel was, which is pretty good. They are amazing birds and if I tell you this next bit you're going to be really impressed because the Norse call them foul gulls because of this rather charming habit they have of regurgitating this foul smelling stomach juice out at any predator. It's a defensive tactic and I'm going to demonstrate it using this fantastic prop and some liquid that is exactly like the foul smelling liquid from their uh, stomach. Okay, okay so I, you're, you're going to be the predator. The predator okay, and, and I'm going to approach you. Are you ready you. for the squirt? Yeah, hold on, I'm going to make sure that the predator... Here is the foul right, so here, smelling the stomach coming in juice. to attack the... Oh, oh whoops, oh, no, oh, no, oh, I've got oh, a bit more, I've got okay. a bit more. Oh, 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 come no, on. Oh, no, oh, no, it's... What have you done? Oh, no, no, oh. we've run out of juice, we've run out of juice. But basically, that will squirt. <laughs> the aim wasn't so good, I've got to practice the aim. We'll go over those feathers and then the predator won't be able to fly, it'll be all sticky and it won't be able to get the chicks or the eggs so I think that's pretty cool it pretty is pretty cool and I've, I've been squirted actually way back in the 1980s I went into an old ruined croft on the western isles of Scotland not knowing that there was a fulmar in there nesting on the windowsill and it regurgitated all of that over me that mixture of Aww. waxy esters and triglycerides and I've got to tell you it was pretty unpleasant I washed I mean I was away from home I was washing stuff in burns you know and it and it stank absolutely stank was it worse you. than a skunk because they're pretty bad, aren't they? It was pretty. Can, can I give you the predator? Yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty, pretty bad. <laughs> no, it's just got to fly high. <laughs> Seriously. Well, the waxy esters and triglycerides. It has that foul-smelling stuff from the stomach has just got to okay. my Okay. Now a lot of people do. Whilst Michaela's going on and being a hope um, oh, so a lot of people contact sticky. us using, you know, social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. But some people take the trouble to actually write us letters, and we like this, of course, because we like everyone to have the capacity to communicate with us. And we've had this letter here from. Let's have a look from Christine Sealby, and she has written, I've always had between six and eight house martin nests around my home. This year, they've not arrived. I could start looking out for them in the past by the 15th of April, and they were always here by the 21st. I'm now very concerned. So Yolo, Christine, up in the Lake District, is very concerned about her house martins. I know you've been keeping a keen eye on yours up there in Allerdale. Yes, indeed. And, and Christine, we've got a, a very similar situation up here. And, and what's happened? Well, it, it's exactly what Nick was explaining earlier on with the weather. We've had a succession of northerly winds all throughout April, much of May. That's kept a lot of the birds down in southern Europe and in North Africa. Finally, the last five or six days, we had some warm winds that's brought the birds in. Our birds have been back here, not showing much sign of, of mating or anything until quite recently. So I'm hoping that there's still time for your birds to make it back just like ours have done. And it's quite interesting, actually, comparing the landscape here at Allerdale in May this year and May last year, because they look very, very different. Last year, of course, we were enjoying some beautiful weather, some sunshine right through May into early June. That brought the trees into leaf, the birch woodland looking stunning there. And then when you compare that with this year, it just looks like a, quite a desolate landscape. The leaves were very late coming out because of the cold weather. Even the bilberry in amongst the heather hadn't really poked up its head. 
That affected the insects, of course, that affected the birds as well here. But I'm pleased to say the last five or six days it has warmed up. There have been a lot of flies on the wing and that's brought the birds out and that includes our house martins and they are back, they're back in good numbers and actually we've got a live camera on one of the nests under the eaves of the big house right now. It's a typical house martin nest, you can see it there tucked underneath the eaves, little entrance hole made from mud of course, they reckon that each one of those nests takes about a thousand beakfuls of mud to build. We've got, I think, six pairs of house martins here. We've got five or six pairs of swifts and a pair of swallows as well. And they've been nest building, they've been mating. Mud, of course, then they line it with bits of grass and feathers. Very nice, comfortable nest, tucked out the way of the worst of the rain there. Now, house martins are UK-wide in decline. Between 1993 and 2018, there was a 45% decline UK-wide. But what's really interesting is that here in Scotland, over exactly the same period, they saw an increase of an incredible 110%. Now, what's happening? Is it another one of these birds that's shifting northwards? It may well be. We're still not sure. Now, some years, house martins can have three broods, but because they've arrived late, I suspect that this year they'll have two broods and no more than that. But it's not just up here, it's back home in Wales as well. Before I came up, right at the end of April, I went out to my local wood in search of a stunning little bird called a pied flycatcher. The males are beautiful, lovely black and white birds, real songsters. I found six pairs, the female was nest building, but no singing, not one male sang because they were spending all of their time looking for food. It was so cold and there was so little food around. And I suspect that this spring is gonna have a long-term effect on a lot of our wildlife. Right, let's step away, take a deep breath. You know what's coming, it's our mindful moment and tonight is brought to you by cameraman Steve Phillips and it's the subject is something that this part of Scotland shares with mid Wales it's something I saw an awful lot of too much of in autumn watch and winter watch tonight's mindful moment is all about rain Well, I tell you, a mindful moment can even make the rain look beautiful. But, I'm, I, you know, I'm glad it's not raining here because it's allowed us to keep a close eye on our feathered friends here in Northern Ireland. But we're not the only ones. A team of scientists have been closely monitoring a very, very special species, a species that is in sharp decline. And this is the iconic profile of a beautiful bird. That is the curlew. Now in spring, at this time of year, these birds leave the estuaries, leave the salt marshes, and they head to the hills to breed. And we were given special access 
to film them in one of their nesting grounds. And you can see it here in that tall grass amongst the wildflowers. It provides the perfect cover for their nest, the perfect ground cover. And in 2017, this area of peatland and wet grassland was found to be really important nesting ground for these birds. So the Loch Ney Landscape Partnership decided they would answer the call and protect these birds. So again, we were able to film here. This is footage from the same site this was filmed last year. And it shows just what important habitat this is. There's the adult poking its head, but just above the vegetation there is the chick. And of course, this is habitat that offers really good foraging, really good protection from predators. But last year, there was a curlew conservation first in this area when the team decided they needed to protect these birds from another threat. And that is this, fire. Now, last year saw a series of fires. There were 12 in total, 12 fires that happened in that area between April and June. This is right in the middle of the curlew breeding season. So under license, the team went to try and retrieve some of the eggs off that nest in the hope that they could save just a few. Now, that intervention really paid off. Curlews normally incubate their eggs for a period of a month. So they took them back to these artificial incubators and they were treated to these absolutely magical moments of a curlew chick hatching out. Six chicks hatched, five of them survived. And this is the very, very first views that these chicks have of the world. This incubator under red light to keep them warm. But as they grew, they grew more confident, grew stronger. They move them on slowly as they start to investigate this area, pecking away, and eventually move them to outdoor pens where they got to practice feeding, stretching their legs, splashing around in water, look, investigating these surrounds. And all of this is absolutely privileged views of these very, very special birds. And there you can see much larger, these birds flapping their wings, getting stronger in order for them to be released into the wild. Now this year, the team have been monitoring the same area again, and they caught these images just a few days ago. Now again, this is the eggs on the nest, but they also had news just this today that there are now chicks on those nests. So the hope is that that nesting ground year on year is gonna become more and more established. So that is some fantastic news. And from here in Northern Ireland, let's head back to wild Ken Hill with Chris and Michaela. Thank you very much, Gillian. Well, we're coming towards the end of our programme, but there is one little thing we wanted to show you, and it's this beautiful shot of a hovering kestrel. And just look at the way that it holds its head. Absolutely static. Look at that. That is that. amazing, Chris. You can see that it's steady because it's in line with the fence, isn't it? It's it is. not moving. And that's how they managed to spy so brilliantly on the voles that they plunged down to on the grass below. Well, that is it from today. We'll be back here from Wild Ken Hill tomorrow and we'll be bringing you a fiesta, a rapturous round of applause for a magnificent raptor. So last week we introduced you to a, a beautiful wildcat kitten. Well, tomorrow I've got even more good news for you. And I'll be joining a sensational seabird survey on Strangford Lock's Bird Island. Now, I know it's half term this week and I know a lot of you or some of you will be away with your kids enjoying the sunshine. And we've got a list of things that we want you to look out for in the spring. It's called our spring watch list and you can check it out on the website. But we want you to look out tomorrow for this. It is a tortoiseshell butterfly. And so if you see one, go and look for one. Get your kids out, go and look for it. Take a photograph and send it in to us. And if we have a chance, 
we'll show it on tomorrow's program. And you can send that into the website, to Facebook, to Instagram. Instagram's a place to go. One o'clock tomorrow, where Hannah will be talking to Gillian. So enjoy the evening. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a great time. Bye-bye.